Welcome back, my dear crime lovers. This is a new episode of The History of the American Mafia, a series brought to podcast by Fabio Fabiano, the true story of the American Mafia, translated and read by me, Grace Cardlisi. I do hope you enjoy this new episode. This is part two of the three-part series on Frank Costello. So, the turning point in Frank Costello's criminal career, just like that of many other criminals, was on January the 17th, 1920. This is the date that marks the beginning of the period that will be remembered to this day as Prohibition. With the introduction of the 18th Amendment to the United States Constitution, the production and sale, but not the consumption, of alcoholic beverages was prohibited. Despite its intent to reduce crime and improve the quality of life, prohibition was never fully implemented. The reasons for its failure can be attributed to the fact that a substantial part of the population wanted to drink. Furthermore, no effective steps were taken by the federal government to enforce the ban for years. Suffice it to say that although the saloons and breweries were closed, alcoholic beverages were readily available and people continued to drink. Speakeasies, or the clubs where alcohol was illicitly distributed, multiplied and it was estimated that there were at least 30,000 in Manhattan alone. Even the restaurants under the counter continued to serve alcoholic beverages to customers. The truth is that the people wanted to drink and so Costello and other gangsters saw the big opportunity that had been presented to them and took advantage of the situation. Smuggling became the real industrial activity for the new emerging group of mafiosi who had just begun to establish themselves. Until that moment, Costello had been engaged in racketeering and criminal activities that had produced modest profits. With the smuggling of alcohol, they had the possibility of getting richer than they could ever have imagined. Costello's organization, led by Lucky Luciano, began smuggling alcohol when Joe Doto, also known as Joe Adonis, started business with Philadelphia bootlegger Waxley Gordon. Joe Adonis, who had set up an agreement to purchase whiskey, did not have the cash to pay for the alcohol and asked Lucky Luciano and Costello to finance the operation for an amount of $35,000. At that point, the smuggling business of this criminal group began with Gordon of Philadelphia. From that moment, the smuggling of alcohol became the most important activity of the Amafia family to which Costello belonged. He optimised the smuggling business and did it by thinking big and going outside the box. Even his rivals admired him. For funding, he is said to have approached Arnold Rothstein, also known in the criminal world as the Brain. Rothstein was the scion of a wealthy Jewish family. According to some, he was the true inspirer of the smuggling business during the Prohibition period. He knew all about business practices, both legal and illegal. Rothstein explained to Costello the best way to be successful in the business. He explained how to organise, how to cut costs and even how to cut a competitor's throat if necessary. The companies that produced alcohol in Great Britain, Canada, France and other countries once prohibition was imposed wanted to stay inside the lucrative US market and welcome the opportunity to sell their products to American bootleggers. Backed by Rothstein's money and advice, Costello soon found a way to illegally import alcoholic beverages into the clandestine market. He looked north across the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Labrador and Newfoundland where he spotted an archipelago of islands called Saint-Pierre-Miquelon. 
It is said that when Constello landed there in 1921 to do business with the mayor, he had enjoyed delicious French food. The two islands, although close to Canada, were actually French territories and therefore outside the jurisdiction of Canada, which at the time was under British control and nominally partnered with the US government to stop the smuggling of alcohol across the Canadian border. Clearly, for an enterprising smuggler like Costello, this very small part of French territory suited his plan perfectly. The sailors and boat owners of these small islands, although survived on thriving fishing, once Costello arrived, were persuaded by the large income to transport alcohol to the American ports. Thus, the two islands with their unique location became important transshipment points for liquor into the United States, including rum. Costello made a deal to import liquor for $2 a case, which he would eventually resell for a hundred times that markup in the United States. Of course, the Italian-American mafioso was greatly favoured by the unsuccessful application of the Prohibition law by the United States government. When Prohibition went into effect in 1920, the federal government contracted several agencies to implement the amendment. Despite the impressive list of agencies, it should be noted that they were all in fact most ill-equipped to fight the vast army of hardened gangsters ready to smuggle liquor to thirsty customers who disapproved of the law. Italian, Irish and Jewish mobsters in Chicago and Detroit were able to evade the inadequate federal government by setting up smuggling routes across Canada and the Great Lakes. Ships laden with tens of thousands of bottles of liquor of all kinds stopped beyond the three-mile limit of US territorial waters. This prevented the possibility of being seized by the Coast Guard. The alcohol carried by the smugglers' ships was produced in England and in the Caribbean. Once transshipped to the French islands adjacent to Canada, the cases of liquor were sent off to Montauk Point, New York, Atlantic City and New Jersey. Costello's smuggling operation reached unprecedented heights. After purchasing up to 13 million bottles of liquor and storing them in Saint Pierre and Miquelon, Costello, in order to bring the cases of liquor ashore, armed a fleet of ships made up of luxury yacht streamers that turned out to be much faster than the Coast Guard boats, which were poorly equipped at the time. He also employed small, fast and almost invisible flat-bottom boats driven by powerful engines. To communicate with the larger smuggling vessels, Costello commissioned the establishment of a few ship-to-shore radio stations located in obscure areas on Long Island. He had also acquired a small air fleet made up of seaplanes capable of detecting the activity of Coast Guard boats. He took advantage of all the new technology available, sparing no expenses. Quite a pioneer with sophisticated, ingenious tools. Once the liquor reached the coast, Costello and his associates, which also include his older brother Edward, had to transport it to customers in New York City and Philadelphia. To do this, Costello used truck convoys. The bootlegging world was ruthless and the trucks carrying the booze were susceptible to hijacking. The roads from eastern Long Island to Manhattan were winding, dark and prone to ambush by competing gangsters. Costello lost a few loads and to stop the loss, he hired men like Meyer Lansky and Bugsy Siegel. The two Jewish gangsters from New York, who he liked and trusted, provided Costello with armed men to protect the loads. Naturally, the relationship he had with Lansky and Siegel 
would continue well beyond prohibition. Despite the losses due to the hijacking, the smuggling operation in 1922 was thriving. He was making millions of dollars because the simple economics of the business allowed a dramatic increase for liquor in the Prohibition era. Whiskey brought in from Canada would be blended with coloured grain alcohol and resold at an incredible markup. Costello, in a very short time, repaid Rothstein's initial investment and was able to do much more. Despite having accumulated large capitals, he always spent his money wisely with targeted investments. He helped his mother move from East Harlem to a modest two-storey house in Astoria's Halsey Street. Meanwhile, his father died on December 12, 1921 of bronchitis, an illness easily treatable today, but not in those years. On his father's death, Costello remained close to his mother, who suffered from diabetes, and with his wife, Loretta, he moved into a comfortable house in Bayside, a residential area in Queens, not far from his mother's home. Smuggling also soon became a stimulus to the economy of some Long Island cities, especially seaside areas such as Greenport, Stirling Cove, Gardiner's Bay. Costello hired many employees capable of carrying the cases of liquor from boats to waiting trucks on their shoulders. They were paid an average of $20 a night. <laughs>